Welcome once again to Media That Made Us, the podcast about the stories and art that influence us to become the people that we will be. I am your host, Scott Paladin, and I'm joined this week by podcaster and writer Justin Jess. And look, I'm going to be honest with you, most of this episode is us talking about Star Wars, but just in case you think that we aren't cool, we're also going to talk about Battletech. So, join us, won't you? it a lot and a guy stopped making it so i'm like well what if i just did that instead <laughs> so this Perfect. is just me me just stealing off of it so um <laughs> we'll see how it goes um, yeah. if someone was to ask who is justin what do you hope the answer is i hope the answer is somebody who spreads joy mm-hmm. um i I consider myself to be somebody who is, who, who, who I have, I have a number of talents, but I think mm-hmm. that the best, the be- the best ones, the most useful ones I have are about making people either laugh or understand something or, um, and I think that spread, enlightening people or making their day better is something that I like to do a lot. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, I, I, retain information very well and i like mm-hmm. explaining and i like talking about stuff with people and i i like to be the i like to be like the maybe the positive version of the nerd guy who says like i'm actually <laughs> yeah. um like I, it's like i don't want i don't want to be the like uh, you know it's like it's the goal is not to be the bad guy who's correcting someone but like mm-hmm. adding context to yeah make make something more enjoyable which is uh, honestly that's yeah less you are wrong about this but instead here like you know this this is cooler than you thought or this is another yeah. thing about it that is li- like what you like yeah. or you know another yeah. angle by which you can look at it yeah i get that yeah uh yeah yeah, yeah I, I can see that sort of one thing i was i was talking on a previous interview about was the idea of like people because several people have just self-described themselves as nerds so far mm-hmm. and I remember a time when that was very pejorative, the concept of a yeah. nerd, right? Like there was, you know, that was even the um, the pro nerd media uh, was still very much bought into the idea that like nerds were, um, uh, what's the word, uh, you know, a, a particular kind of awful, right? Um, yeah. But when you take it down to it, the, the concept of a nerd is somebody who is like defined by their own enthusiasm, right? Like they've yes. taken something or some group of things and been like, I, this makes me excited. This makes me happy. And I get joy from that. I, you know, in, indulge in that kind of um, joy, which is, you know, really great. And I think that if when taken from that perspective, you know, being a nerd is really cool, you know? Yeah. it is. It's, it's like, it's something that I've all like, I've always like, I I got that from both my parents, honestly, like mm-hmm. who, who are like pe- both incredibly passionate people. Yeah. Um, like my, like you know, it, it, like my dad is somebody who is like was of that generation, like you know, was of that previous generation yeah. of nerd. Yeah. Um, where, you know, had like some very had some very niche stuff. I like I. I built I, like I remember building a computer with him in like the nineties. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, it's it's always it's it's always been there, but it's also like it has become a lot more. It's it's become a lot more culturally like oh hey no the like things that we would consider nerd stuff are, I mean they've always been mainstream culture stuff. It's yeah. it's it's just the things that we've always considered nerd stuff are just they're just genre stuff. Yeah, yeah, and. Yeah. Everybody and people like genre stuff. It's just that you know, devoted fandom and devoted energy to it yeah. is something that um, the that our resistance to it is partly because I don't know. There's there's a there's a means there is a a thing of oh you like something oh, a little bit too much or but it's also sort of sexist in, yeah. originally. Because I mean, the the biggest hardcore fans originally were women. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Depending depending on the exact property, but absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like, you know, I, I I can't remember where I talked about this with somebody, but I, I, I was jokingly defining, like, there there are four eras of fandom. Mm-hmm. There is pre-Conan, like pre-Conan Doyle. Okay, okay. Pre-Star Trek, yeah. pre-X-Files, and everything afterwards. Okay. So, <laughs> okay, so wait. Um, yeah, okay. I get, I get you. I get you on that one. Yeah. Basically, but like, like Conan Doyle is the invention of, like, the modern... Like, Sherlock Holmes is the invention of modern fan culture. Yeah, for sure. In its proto-form. Star Trek is where it first gets its real big push. Mm-hmm. The X Files is where I mean there there's stuff also happening at that time, but that's where the yeah. internet comes in and news groups. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Everything afterwards is just building on and evolution. Yeah, there there's like a movement from because well, because I think that that '90s era was the last era of fandoms being sort of a cult like a cult movement, you know, mm-hmm. an underground movement, and that by the time you hit the the not the early 2000s but the mid 2000s and later. Like, you know, fandoms go mainstream and every yeah. big property has a fandom. Um, mm-hmm. Probably there's something to be said about how uh, companies figured out that they could monetize fandoms and that's yeah. what brought them into the mainstream. Um, but let's not talk about that right now. <laughs> Backing up a bit, um, what kind of kid were you? Um, so I was um, a, I'm, we're going to say like ADHD aus- autistic kid. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> like, Common like, refrain so far. <laughs> so I was decidedly bad at being a kid. Uh-huh. Um, I was, I, like, I was the person, or I was the kid who was like deeply into reading. And mm-hmm. um, like, it's one of those things where it's like, I try to, it, it's, like, I know I watched stuff as a kid. Like, I remember watching DBZ. Mm-hmm. I remember watching Pokemon and Digimon. But I don't remember, like, being, like, a huge television kid. And, like, that's probably, like, that's probably just because I'm, like, um, forgetting something here. Mm-hmm. But, like, I remember, like, I remember much more being a, like, book kid. Like, I was the person, like, I was the kid who... We would go to the library and I yeah. would check out half a dozen books and I would be done with them the day the day of. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, so like that was that was much more my speed. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I was also somebody who made friends vi- like who was very who like compared to other kids. And like this is something that carried on through like being a teen. Like I made mm-hmm. friends with older people much more easy oh sure yeah 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 Yeah, like i remember like i i was i wanted to i knew i wanted to be a writer very early on in life Mm -hmm. and there was and like when i was a teenager my mom who was you know a a published author at that point had a group that she would write she would like go to her writing days with and these were all like women in their 40s and 50s yeah and i and, and it was the the fact of it was is that i attended once and was not asked not to come back um <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know and i i was the i was also the um the like stereotypical pleasure to have in class oh sure yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I, I was like i was that poster child of okay deeply you know i was like i was somebody who's like you know deeply into the things that i liked and very and yeah. like you know was that kind of kid um and uh like i wasn't a very much of a social butterfly so it's like re like reading and eventually once we like got to that point i like games were also a huge part of mm-hmm. like like video that. games you mean yeah video games yeah yeah uh i mean also board games um, okay yeah. like i i was somebody who like bef- this is like you know this isn't like 2001 2002 before like okay. we get that modern board game like i um there was a the the euro game invasion i'm thinking yeah is- yeah um funny enough that one of the game like that we like my parents and the and the guy who would eventually become my stepfather of all weird mm-hmm. things um would do board game nights and one of the games was a it's sort of like ticket to ride except like it's the difference between like the modern version where it's designed to play on a phone and the like '90s PC version where you need charts. 
Okay. Like we were playing the latter version of that. It was a game but called like Euro Rails. Euro Rails, interesting. Like and, like a little. It's got maybe has a little bit of a uh, of tabletop war game blood in it. In its gene pool, <laughs> at least a little bit. There, yeah. there would be like it was like it had like this dot board. You had like it was it was basically you had to build like train lines across Europe. Yeah, and there were like these little dots that you used to, for like, you know, one dot was however many kilometers, mm -hmm. and you actually drew on the board with crayon. <laughs> like awesome. that's the kind of game we're talking about there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, whereabouts did you grow up? I was in. Geek, like you know, Geek Central, yeah. in in the old term of uh, Silicon Valley. Okay. I, I grew mm -hmm. up in San Jose, so like you know, I yeah yeah yeah. Um, I used to like I grew up literally like, if you turned out from our street, there was an old IBM plant. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of these places where like there was, uh, like compared to like maybe some other place in the country, like a yeah. place that was like very well funded, you know, like there there was the like computerized libraries in our schools yeah and you know growing up which was wild yeah, uh, yeah. so uh like a suburban kid or a uh, suburban yeah there yeah, there yeah, is yeah. there is not a part there is not a part of silicon valley that is not suburban yeah um, okay like, you know it, it's it's sort of this weird thing because it's like san jose was farmland mm -hmm. before it just accidentally happened to spawn the biggest industry on the planet sure yeah um and so like everything is super spread out our downtown is like this is a the stupid things you learn is uh the downtown of san jose has a built has a mandatory basically restriction on how big you can build okay because downtown is where the flight path for arriving airplanes like goes through right, right, right so you right, can't right. build above a certain height yeah yeah stuff. which makes and uh, probably like a lot of places that experienced their growth um you know second half of the 20th century or later mm -hmm. it's a lot more car dependent a lot more uh developed oh, yeah. in that way yeah uh a lot of texas is the same way where like it's come it's it's oil boom so yeah. you know it's not dense urban development the way that you'll see in some place like new york or um you know certain other parts of you know older cities yeah. with with where they had their development in the uh, 19th century so i imagine yeah i can i can, I can picture what you're what you're what you're talking about yeah yeah if you, if you, if you oh, didn't have a car you were like you were you know there there is public transit but you know eh. yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah um and and there's that like brief period where you're where you're at least with, with when i was growing up that where you uh, everything was centered around bikes before you get your car and it's mm -hmm. still pretty rough on a bike even uh compared to, to walking uh, uh so Okay, so we're we're going to be talking about a particular Star Wars property here in a minute. Yeah. But when I mean you're you're young enough that, uh, geez, do you even do you even have do you even have experience with pre special edition Star Wars? Yes. So okay. uh, my introduction to Star Wars is very funny because it's like uh, I, I I was born in 1990. So yeah, um, like you know I we had the original editions on tape. Yeah. And I, I can't remember do. how old it was. I must have been like. Hold on. When did the special edition come out? Um, cause that's it was okay. It was for the twenty. It was for the twentieth anniversary. Mm -hmm. Um, which so I must have been sick. It must it it I must have been six at the time okay. when um my yeah yeah I was like it's yeah when my dad's like oh hey we're gonna watch my we're gonna watch my favorite movies yeah. Okay. Um, and you know, so we watch Star Wars. I love it. We watch yeah. Empire. I'm heart crushed. I love it. Yeah. Um, and then out of all the funny things, I noped out of Return of the Jedi, really, as a child because I found Jabba the Hutt very scary. Oh uh, yeah, I could get that. You can you could you have a you could have a very glandular response to to that particular puppet. Uh, yeah. That design is is something you could really like, whether or not he's even doing anything. Just like I, I could totally see that. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And but then like a couple months later, Dad's like, "Okay, you're gonna give it another try because it's gonna be it, it, because then it was March, and yeah. Return of the Jedi was coming out in special edition in theaters. Yeah. And I remember, um, there is a specific theater which is, 
um, no longer present, I believe. It is mm-hmm. across the street from the Winchester Mystery House, which yeah. um, is like the only landmark in San Jose. Sure, sure, um, yeah. yeah. But so I remember like it, the theater was a, it was a large circular building. And okay. I remember sit like because it was like a Friday morning showing like mm-hmm. standing in line yeah. because that's because we used to do that. We used oh, yeah. to do that, children. We used to stand in line for movies waiting for them to be let in. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, have to get your tickets ahead of time but you didn't have to assign seating it was just wherever you ended up yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um and no then, big recliners or anything like that yeah um and then like we we, we saw return of the jedi and i was just like i was in love for life and this and mm-hmm. like and funny enough return of the jedi if you put a gun to my head is probably my favorite movie to watch the original trilogy okay all right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah fair. There's that's that's one of the one one of the few trilogies of any kind where there is a there isn't really a wrong answer. Right. Like, yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking of maybe Back to the Future also doesn't have a wrong answer. I personally would say two is a wrong answer, but that's just me. <laughs> oh, but two is so campy and fun. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like it's not. I mean, yeah, the. I think there's a lot of appeal on that one. Um, yeah. But yeah, but, but, I, I but, see that. Yeah. 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 The, the, but yeah, also the original trilogy of, of Star Wars, I think like you can, if anybody says to me, my favorite is yeah. A New Hope, my favorite is Empire Strikes Back, my favorite is Return of the Jedi. It's like, yeah, I can see the argument for all of those. I mean, like, you may not happen to agree at any particular time, but like, it's not like somebody says that and you go, what kind of person are you? <laughs> like, it's yeah. like, no, I get it. I get it. I get that one. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's where if like, comparatively, if somebody said Rise of Skywalker was their favorite film, I would check them for brain trauma. Yeah. 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 <laughs> or if somebody was like, oh no, uh, Matrix Revolutions is better than the original. And you're like, what the hell's wrong with you? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. But, the, but that original set, uh, set now. Okay. So, yeah. Had you did you actually see did you have a reaction to the special editions then like the, the, the I changes I I um, I'm curious I don't think that I have really a huge mm-hmm. like there's nothing in my like I think it was because I was I like I was such a formative age that like yeah. the between like because I had seen because I like I'd seen the first two original editions and we saw the special editions in theaters yeah and then so I don't think there was anything that. Like I particularly like found like, and to this day, I don't think there's anything that I, I think the only thing that annoys me out of the special edition is like the extended song in return, return of the Jedi. Sure. Sure. Because that is the, that is the equivalent of piss break. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Because nothing, it's, it's it's nothing happens and it's like, it's also not a banger. Like if it, if if they had really introduced a banger, like if it had been a bop, like it would be a different sort of thing, but like, they didn't they didn't put in a better song. Like it yeah. had been a good song, then like we we'd be talking different things. But it's uh yeah. Like I think a lot of like the ex- I think like a lot of the extended stuff in like the in the in, in most of the movies is usually stuff that's like it's fill it's either filling in stuff or it's giving you a wider it's 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 widening the camera lens a little bit. Like, sure. Yeah. Like the in the cantina scene, like you you know you're seeing more aliens and stuff. Yeah. You know, but like that one, it's just. We want to show off some new special effects. Interesting. Um, See, I'm just older, just enough older than you. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a really strong reaction to those special mm-hmm. editions um, that like something about the tone changed for me when I watched those. And in fact, I saw a, um, a oh, what's the word, an early screener for A New Hope when it came out on special edition. There was, was the one where you had the comments. And they've had you mm-hmm. fill out a thing at the end. Um, test screening. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Um, and I, it, to me, I was, I, I've often wondered, like, what is it that bothered me? Is it just that something changed? But, like, I realized, I went back and, and watched some of the, because I've always grabbed the, um, like, the despecialized editions to have on my mm-hmm. own particular collections. And I looked back at, at, at one, some of the comparison scenes the other day, and I was like, oh, to me, this is not true of everything, but the, the mm-hmm. where that opinion formed was in A New Hope, it's, busier the universe feels busier they added so much additional stuff that it actually changed the way the like concept of the world felt a little bit to me because it Mm -hmm. turned from kind of a like Tatooine turns from kind of a desolate place to a much more busy 
much more alive universe, mm -hmm. uh, which is an interesting change. Yeah. Not, this, not necessarily better or worse, but I'm like, oh, that's where that came for me. Uh, yeah, no, I, I get that. That's, yeah, I mean, and part of me is like the part of me that likes building and like yeah. and like seeing those sort of things i like i like a little busier scene it's why like some of my favorite stuff in like the prequels is seeing like coruscant just yeah, sure. being around it's yeah um but yeah, yeah. Uh, like so this this is the why like wildest thing so uh about eight years ago eight or nine years ago i was working at a used bookstore mm -hmm. which was you know um which is a unique place to kind of work when you're somebody who is interested in media. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and wish I'd know, I wish I'd known you then because at one point we got the beta max of star Wars. Ooh, cool. <laughs> and, uh, and that would have been one of those things where it'd be like, Hey, let me rig up Scott and see if he wants this and we can ship it out. to him. <laughs> Very possibly. I'd buy a beta max machine for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. That'd be cool. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so when did you find the the extended universe from there? What was your introduction to the stuff beyond the movies? So a couple things. There mm -hmm. are um like there the first one that I like the first one that latches into my mind, it might not be chronologically the first, but sure. it is it's the one with the heaviest gravitational yeah. pull is the Rogue Squadron game. Okay. Which is um absolute banger. Um, it, it's, I, I would consider it like sort of a platonic ideal of a nineties video game. Okay. And the fact that like, not only like it is, it's fun, but there are also parts of it that are f incredibly, unbelievably frustrating. Oh, sure. Yeah. Part of that was because I was playing it on PC, not N64 because we did not have a game console yeah. when we got it. Um, and there are the and so I was playing it using a keyboard. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. playing a flight sim on a keyboard is the kind of thing that only a child who doesn't know better does. <laughs> I, I I played quite a lot of, of X Wing with a keyboard before I, I learned better. Um so yeah, I know I know I know your pain. Was was Rogue Squadron the one where I I'm maybe I'm misremembering, but I seem to recall it being basically like a like a rail shooter. But F, but but no. So there was a game. So the, the rail shooter was a game called um, like a it was a it was called Rebel Assault. Rebel Assault. There were, there were two okay. of them. Yes. Um, okay. So okay. Then I'm then I'm not. I, yeah. I was I was I was sitting there going. Is this, is this really their favorite game? Because that is an that is a wrong answer. If that was your favorite yeah. game, but that's because I was misremembering Rogue Squadron or, or yeah. Rebel Assault as Rogue Squadron. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No. The, the, it was fully three D, um, mm -hmm. and you could, and it was um, like I think it was sixteen missions, and it's all set between, except for the last mission, it's all set between A New Hope and Empire. Okay. And it's you go around in various ships, blow stuff up. Um, there's like a bear like there's barely any plot in it um, okay but like you know it's it's fun and like and, and it was the thing that solidified that like my f one of my favorite parts of star wars was the space stuff oh yeah and specifically the the sort of the 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 military pilot side of things sure yeah um I like the, the two things that are the most core for me are the 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 space fighter stuff and yeah. the Jedi stuff. Okay. Um, you know, it's like they're, they're like th those are the two ones for me, and um, so it's like Rogue Squadron, sort of like it, it's like you know, is that game where I probably have, you know, if you read a, if you, I don't know what number you would read to me if you were a mo if you were like an omniscient deity who knew exactly how many hours I put into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But whatever number you would say, I'd say that's right. Yeah, unless it was super uh, low, right? <laughs> as long as it's a ridiculously high number. Right? Yeah, and so then I and so then I started off with like going to the, like go to the library because it's like I would see stuff, um, mm -hmm. and the pickings for young adult Star Wars mm. in like the late nineties, yeah, were not great. Um, yeah, so there were there were two there were two mains there were two main ones. There was a series called Galaxy of Fear, 
okay. which was Goosebumps but Star Wars. <laughs> Um, like literally, that. that's what it was. Yeah. It was the yeah, most yeah, yeah. Sh- shameless ripoff of Goosebumps. Awesome. Um, it, and they had like these holographic covers, which were yeah, yeah, Chef Kiss. Lovely. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, like uh, with like the the author of those is cl- was clearly having the most fun of his life because he was oh, like, yeah, he, like they, I can't remember who wrote it, but like they said, like um, in an interview we basically had a, I basically had a mandate from the publisher to uh-huh. end each chapter on the schlockiest cliffhanger I possibly could. Awesome. Um, which is great. I wasn't a huge horror fan at the po- at that point, but it was like, yeah. I, I, I devoured them up. The other one was a series called young Jedi Knights, which was about Ben and Leia's kids. Yeah. Um, and it's by gosh, uh, Ken, Kenneth Anderson, who wrote a bunch of other Star Wars stuff, yeah. and his spouse, whose name I cannot remember. Um, okay. Or I, I, maybe not spouse, but uh, Rebecca Moesta. That's what it was. Okay. Um, I don't know. It was, it was his wife. Okay. Um, but they're they're fun, but they're also sort of like, they're, they're, there's not a ton going. They're, there's not a ton of depth in them. Yeah. If, um, I re- if I recall, and maybe this isn't that particular series, but at the time when I was reading, when I was still reading the Extended Universe stuff, you could tell that at LucasArts Publishing Central, they did not know what to do with those characters. Like, oh yeah, the 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 solo kids. They're like, they're like bouncing back and forth by characterization from book to book. Like nobody had laid out a plan on that one. Yeah. Um, which, frankly, that's actually a pretty good. Um, uh, so you could apply that idea broadly to the extended universe. Uh, yeah, is that they. It, it often was bouncing back from author, author to author about whether or not something was going to happen or not, or if yeah. the character was going to be useful or not, or get <laughs> treated well or not. And I mean, and so I got, exp- and so eventually there was a point where it was, I self graduated myself from mm-hmm. young adult books to, I'm just going to go to the adult sci-fi section and read and, and like, look at the backs of books and yeah, yeah. come out. And and to, to be fair, even the adult uh, Star Wars books are pretty much young adult fiction. Like they yeah. never get, they never get um, heavy. <laughs> yeah, they're they're yeah. It's not until like later on with like there there is some stuff that is like, well, we're having a cultural moment about nine eleven and terrorism, and so we're gonna oh, do okay. some yeah, like yeah. darker stuff. Yeah, I'm looking at you, use on Vong stu- uh, oh, yeah. stuff. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I so that, that like that that is happening, but it's also yeah. like when I started this, at least that was before then. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so, I mean, overall, I don't know when I originally like a when the original point where I got to the X Wing books were. Yeah. Uh, because it's like there, there's that point where it's like where it was like going through a bunch of stuff. Um, and not realizing that like where anything fit in the chronology because this is before fan wikis really existed. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And the only way you could tell like what had been published was on the inside cover. Yeah. On like the check these out also, mm-hmm. and you they wouldn't tell you where they were in the chronology or anything. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a which I think is something that we have lost as a culture of just get getting exposed to stuff that we have no context for sure um, yeah, yeah yeah but um and so it's like you know there's stuff that was like um dark saber which is um mm-hmm. which is a book that about the huts trying to build the death star laser on a budget <laughs> that is literally the plot of that book yeah, yeah. um but the two but the two big things that like really like latched on and latched on to a lot of star wars fans i think yeah. um like there's the thrawn trilogy the thrawn trilogy is its own thing i i think it's but like being created at, being originally written at the same time shares a lot of creative dna with it is the x-men series mm-hmm. um and the x-men series is actually two series mm-hmm. um so they're the, and it's written by two different authors. There's Michael Stackpole, okay. and Aaron Alston. Uh, okay. Aaron Alston. Uh, uh, they're the first four books are by Stackpole. 
Um, and they are the, what is considered like the Rogue Squadron set of the books. Okay. Gotcha, um, gotcha. And so that is like, that is very traditional sci-fi. Like that is X-Wing fair. Like it's X-Wing core. It's about yeah. like, oh, hey, it's the, it's the new Republic now. Yeah. We're building a special fighter squadron to take on weird, to, to, to liberate Coruscant and yeah, yeah. chase we need, down. We need the Top Gun, but for Star yeah. Wars, right? Yeah. It's, it is it is Top Gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, Wraith Squadron is three books. Yeah. Um, and it's written by Aaron Alston. And it is, whereas Star where whereas Rogue Squadron is Top Gun, Wraith Squadron is Dirty Dozen. Like, okay, that's, gotcha, that, gotcha, like, gotcha. You know, It's the, like, the easiest way to... Um, summarize both series there are two additional books um that are both s- s- solo stuff um i think uh first one is by stack by stack hole called isard's revenge which is which is about a um it involves a clone of a previous villain coming like or, or the clone <laughs> is the debt like the, the the deceased there's a yeah. clone involved a bad a, a bad guy comes back for a, a various sure. thing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's the last one, which is uh, written by Aaron Alston, which is Starfighters of Automar, which is literally just, um, it's it's like three musketeers in space. Um, I'm sold. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's yeah, like. Yeah, it, it's like the, the it's literally we, uh, Wedge Antilles goes to a planet is and is assigned as a diplomat because the the planet of hats is about military like military like prowess yeah. and their big thing is dog fighting. It okay. is the most ham fisted like uh, setup for it. a book, but it's that's, literally that's that's the author being on his bullshit. He's like, screw it, I'll just yeah. come up with a reason for this to work. <laughs> It's and, and and like two thirds of the book is just four. It's it's like four main characters hanging around and being bros. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, no, it's perfect. Um, love it. Yeah, love it. There is a tenth book um, that was published thirteen years after the last one. Okay. Um, and we honestly, I haven't read it because it's one of those things where it's just like, oh, I don't know if I want to. Yeah, something like that. When when a series returns or a any kind of continuation happens with a big break in the middle it's like ooh, that's you're rolling in a dice and if you Mm -hmm. weren't like hungry for the last like if it was something like oh this had already been done and you're like you've you've settled with it it's like what do i gain you know Mm -hmm. like i could lose i could lose by reading this there are there are there's lots of work out there that you know it it exists in by itself it's fantastic and then if you add more on it makes it worse and you're yeah. like, well if i if i just don't read it then i don't have to take that risk of it of it turning out to be bad <laughs> yeah and the thing that let me know that i didn't want to read it was that it was aaron alston writing okay aaron alston is the superior of the two sure um we can i mean we've got you know i could talk about my problem like my, my my various hiccups with michael stackpole until the heat death of the universe but okay um but like Aaron Alston is the better writer, but he yeah. is also the one who I think was he was maybe the first writer who I could do, like who I could say did this of like reaching into your chest and just like full on Mortal Kombat ripping out your heart. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because one thing that the X Wing novels do that like I don't like I hadn't encountered a lot in fiction before. It at least like from like my YA and various things is a lot of people die in the X-Wing books. Yeah. And it's generally people you care about. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, if you're, if you're writing a series, that's basically the, um, you know, the combat, you know, the ongoing uh, uh, tale of, uh, of combat uh, from a, for following a particular group, you have to do that. Like that's, that's, yeah. that's structurally part of it. Otherwise it turns into Saturday morning cartoons, right? Where, yeah. Where, Nobody mm. ever dies. Everybody like you know. There's yeah. a lot of explosions, but nothing ever gets hurt. Yeah. Um, but there is a scene in the first X-wing book. Yeah. Uh, 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 where or, or the first Rogue Squadron book, where like it's before even like their first combat assignment. They have like they've like landed on a planet, mm. and Imperial spies have been tracking the squadron through like its trading and stuff. Yeah, and there's just a raid of like it's not like the stormtroopers in white. It's yeah. a bunch of like security agents in black, yeah. and they just like storm the base and like 
two people die like very like sudden deaths they don't go out like heroes one of them's like right. literally shot in their sleep yeah um and it's like for like like a nine ten eleven year old reading yeah. that for the first time it's like what is this yeah um, that's heavy yeah it's um for for like it being a star wars book like yeah. book series it is it's very focused on the idea of like yeah sure there's cool like heroic stuff but war is hell and oh yeah 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 i've I, i've been saying for for 20 years now that and i i mean i'm behind on the um disney series the series is <laughs> so there's mm-hmm. it, forgive me if this is if this has been done uh if not in name at least in practice but like the the star wars story i want to see is like small stories on the trenches right like yeah. you want to see the rebel troopers who are on the front lines i i'm i'm yeah. hearing that this is what andor is in a lot of ways andor is very much that yeah. from a political espionage lean yeah um i, like, I think that I mean, it's what gave it to me like it, it's like there is some stuff with like the senate but it yeah. is it's honestly like prestige drama wheeling and dealing sure yeah with people making like impossible decisions which um i, I just think if you if 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 you're if I was Marvel or not Marvel, if I was Disney and wanted to make a million dollars off of a television show, you just make Band of Brothers, but Star Wars. Yeah, like you will, like Band of Brothers is already incredibly popular. You just do the same thing, but in the Star Wars universe, people will eat that shit up like incre- like with a spoon they'll shovel that yeah. slop into their mouth. Um, and I would love. I mean, I'm one of them. I want to be there. Yeah. <laughs> I want to do it. Um, but that was always the appeal of the. I I, I didn't read the X Wing books, but the. Um, the stuff that was set in the low non Jedi yeah. version of the Star Wars universe, where yeah, mm-hmm. there are Jedi, yes, there is the Force, but that's over there somewhere. You may hear about it, and it's yeah. the part of the universe where reasonably lots of people might think the Force doesn't exist, you know, yeah. because it. And that 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 version of the setting is so compelling to me. Oh yeah, it's it's the like the. The the parts of me that like really like the the X-Wing and, like, the Rogue Squadron, Wraith Squadron and stuff, mm-hmm. there is a Jedi in yeah. Rogue Squadron. Um, oh, how to talk about Corrin Horn. <laughs> um, oh, I can I can feel the tiredness. <laughs> um, so, okay, well, uh, okay, let's do this. Let's talk about Michael Stackpole. Okay. Michael Stackpole has a, has a plot he has done twice. Okay. Um, okay, you before have... you start, is it very obviously his fetish? Um, it's not a fetish, so okay. which is like a very specific trope. Okay, then we're not in a gargoyles Batman animated series thing again. <laughs> no. Have, have um, I told you that story? Just, just no. this might be cut, yeah. but go where, for it. Okay. Um, there's an episode of uh, Batman the animated series where a mad scientist turns Catwoman into a like anthropomorphic Catwoman. Like <laughs> she gets, she turns into a furry, and she uh-huh. has a uh, remote romantic relationship with a large black cat man, like Panther Man, right? And they have like a whole, you know, not like the kind of a tender moment at the end. And then she goes back to being a human, blah, 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 blah. So, okay, that's weird. And then I'm watching Gargoyles a few years later. And in Gargoyles, a, a, a young woman is turned into a orange cat woman, this time with wings. And so is Elise Maza's brother turned into a large black cat man. And they fall in love. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on here, man? What? I, and I looked it up. They were not written by the same person. They were written by two different people who were married to each other. <laughs> okay. That is so much better than it being written by the same person. <laughs> Isn't it, though? Uh... I know. That's the only thing I know about these people, and that is too much information. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I derailed this. Oh, yeah, please, no. please yeah. tell me about Cornhorn. <laughs> so, God, must I? Uh, so, so, so. Cornhorn is a he is an ex cop. Okay. Um, though he though I will say that Cornhorn is a side to cop at birth. Um, <laughs> like he has that energy. Um, and throughout the ser- throughout the series, it's like it, it's one he figures out that he is a Jedi, but specifically a, from a line of Corellian Jedi who okay. don't play by the rules and have their own traditions. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, just feel like just feel that. And know this was written in 1995. Oh yeah, that um, is a that's a very mid 90s idea. Yeah. Yeah, um, and he's he's a, he's a good he's a good pilot border like you know. Yeah. And if he if he puts himself into it, he could be great. So he has a oh, gosh, I gotta get the woman's name right because God knows nothing else respects her. Okay. Um. Okay. Um. His 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 romantic interest throughout the series is a woman named Mirax. Okay. Um, Mirax Tarek is the daughter of a guy named Booster Tarek, who was <laughs> Booster Tarek. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck um, everything else. I want a book about him. <laughs> I mean, he is he is a recurring character throughout the star throughout the Star Wars series. Okay. He is a pirate and smuggler. Yeah. Um, who Corin's dad put in jail for a very long time. Okay. Okay. Um, just to, just to like for Booster Tarek. Booster Tarek at one point just salvages a star destroyer mm-hmm. through the most sketchy, Ill- like the sketchy, barely legal yeah. means possible and paints it red and makes it cer- and like turns it into a casino. <laughs> I love it. Mr. Tarek is like the reason why the EU was at least salvageable. Um, yeah, no, there's, there's some good shit there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but when Mirak <laughs> is introduced to the story, she, yeah holds a great grudge towards Corin because yeah. you know his 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 dad ruined her dad's life and ruined her childhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And throughout the course of like three additional books, like Corin is presumed dead multiple times. Mm-hmm. Um they they have like the they have the they have the the slap slap kiss sort of romance. Classic. And you know, and and they they eventually get married and stuff and you know, that's that's fine. Until I find out this is his second run at that exact same plot. Okay. And that he had done the exact same story, except with royalty, like okay. royalty nobility, in Battletech. <laughs> like 10 years I'm before. I'm so glad you brought up Battletech. <laughs> <laughs> because Michael Stackpole, my man, refuses to not reuse a plot. Uh, <laughs> I love it. I d- I'm not mad at all. That's so perfect. Um. Yeah. It's... <laughs> It is like reading this. I was like, I, I like in like my like my college days. I have read a bunch of BattleTech books because I turned out to be a glutton for punishment. Oh god, um, I'm so glad uh, we, because I'm so, I'm now we get to talk about BattleTech too. So uh, oh, we'll, we'll, gosh, we're gonna hold uh, off on that for a sec. But <laughs> yeah, and then I was like reading this, and it's like this seems this seems familiar <laughs> like like yeah. there are specific plot beats that are being hidden like that were ringing a bell that i was yeah. like oh shit <laughs> i mean what's the chance that a that a star trek fan is also going to read some battle tech books man he's it's totally that was not a risky yeah. move at all <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, i love um, it the 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 one thing i will say is that um uh, like there there was an x-wing miniatures game that came, yeah. that as that fantasy flight does i heard good things about it, it. Yeah, it's a very fun game. Mm-hmm. Um, I consider one of my greatest things to happen at a con was getting Michael Stack pulled aside by Corn Horde card. <laughs> because, right. like, Corn Horde is a character who I would say, like, he is, I, I would say, like, the, the between the, the first four books of the series, mm-hmm. um, he, like, him and Wedge have sort of, like, equal narrative interiority like they're okay, right, they're right. the co-protagonists of the book yeah yeah yeah. they're both the pov yeah. character so to speak yeah and like no care i don't think there's a character that i like lovingly hate more than corn horn <laughs> because yeah. like like over the course of it because this happened to basically everything in the old like he yeah. became like he eventually became a jedi knight yeah, yeah. um but doing it in his own badass way in another book that Stackpole wrote that was literally written in the first person. And let me tell you, 300 pages of core and horror and interiority was, uh, oh, it's enough yeah. to induce a gag response. Yeah, there was definitely a a thing where every protagonist, every cool smuggler or pilot protagonist had to turn into a Jedi at some point, right? Yeah. Over the course of however many series, you know, it happened to the Dark Force, the, the um, to the, oh, what was his name? Uh, uh, the, Kyle Katarn. Kyle Katarn. Um, 
yeah, it's like they just were like, oh, well, make him a Jedi. It's got to happen eventually. Yeah. Uh, it even happened to the protagonist of the X-Wing video game strategy guide narrative that existed. Oh, gosh, that's so funny. Which I do not. We're, we're talking about influential media. This, yeah. this this book lives in my brain for no goddamn reason. <laughs> this is the, the, the official strategy guide for the original X-Wing oh, DOS game. And um, in between the various, like, here's how you defeat this particular mission, and here's some strategy tips on how to do it. Somebody had written a narrative centering around a character named Kian Farlander. Oh, yeah. Because they just decided to take the 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 the, the formula for how to make a Star Wars name, right? Um, yeah. And... Yeah, of course. Like over the course of his of his of his thing, he's like, "Oh well, it turns out I'm also kind of a Jedi too." <laughs> it's like, I I want what they were smoking in the in the nineties, like Lucas Creative. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it's it's such a dumb thing. Like, why did this even? I guess maybe just they needed to pad out the book. They're like, let's just yeah. put some more more stuff in here. I mean, um, there he's... there is something about like the nineties Star Wars where it's like they're taking this very raw sort of like like you know there's yeah nine like there's eight hours of movie there if you're being generous yeah um and like there's like a hold on it for like 15 years yeah after a new hope and like the only thing that really comes out like between like a new hope and the early 90s are some comics yeah which and some and some books yeah yeah um but then like once you hit the early 90s they're like let's turn on the merch machine yeah um and there and I mean, like the other thing that like really like I think it gets even like it gets equal dedication in the first X Wing book to like the no it's it's in the dedication for the Thrawn books the first okay. Thrawn book is the old Star Wars D six RPG yeah because the writers for that just they were like the only people who were allowed to make new stuff for a while. Yeah. And so they just kept making books and just adding stuff in. Oh yeah. Some and, of which is still on Wikipedia. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and writer and writers would just take that, like, you know, take like, because they, they, they would like, Oh, Hey, here, like these, these RPG writers would say like, Oh, Hey, we made a non star destroyer ship. The Imperials have. Yeah. yeah and yeah, yeah. And like, uh, Timothy Zahn is like, yeah, I'll just take these, take all these infor- this information yeah. of like, put it into the Thrawn books so like that there's stuff there. Yeah, because um, otherwise the universe is kind of bare if you could only pull stuff from the movies. Did yeah. You, did you ever encounter just to, while we're talking about how weird that early Star Wars, like like midnight, the early star, early '90s Star Wars um, fandom was? Did you ever encounter the collectible cards? I did not. That, the, so uh, yeah, th- this is. This is such a weird, like, every single character that appears on screen for more than about three seconds in all of the movies, because they wanted to make some money, they made a collectible card out of them, which means they all had to be named. And so somebody's job was to just go through, and, like, the guy running through Bespin with a ice cream maker... Has an My official, hero. yeah, has an official name because somebody had to make it for the collectible card games, and a bunch of them still are in canon and stuff. They just gotta yeah. get dragged back in. But it's like that's how, like, barren things were. Is that like the only person who was allowed to make stuff up was writing like the names on cards at that time? Yeah, it's like when it's... have you ever been? Have you ever uh, like checked out a uh, a subreddit or a or a fan community for a TV show that's been off the air for a little while? And, like, yes. they're not sure if they're going to get it. And, like, the first couple of months after it goes off the air, they're pretty normal. And then the next few months, it's just some fan art. And then occasionally somebody will start posting, like, a fanfic. And then, like, things get weirder and weirder and weirder yeah. over time until they're all really angry or something. <laughs> yeah, that that is the Star Wars fandom in the early 90s. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, and, and it was just, there was, like, this, like, I the 90s creative energy. It was just like so freaking chaotic. And yeah. I mean, I think this is turning more into a general Star Wars nineties thing than it is sure. the X Wing books, which I'm fine with. No, um, fine. Are you familiar with the glove of Darth Vader? Ooh, this this is ringing a bell, but it's not dragging up actual memories. So there were six young adult novels. Uh huh. Um, that were, um, that were written like I think junior novels. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. that were written in the in the nineties. Like these are all like 
a hundred, like, you know, like 150 pages at most. Uh Um, These are these weird alt timeline things. Yes. Which are post Return of the Jedi adventures. Okay. That, I mean. This is where Troculus comes from. Tricoculus. Yes. yes, Okay. (laughs) Now I remember. (laughs) Listeners, if. So, so the, the, the hint of the series is that. This is about the successor to the emperor, who has to be appointed by a council of dark prophets. Okay. Um, <laughs> like I'm just gonna list off things in this series. There yes. is a conference of moths that is called the Mofferents. <laughs> <laughs> the the prophets of the dark side literally they 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 welcome each other with the phrase "I bid you dark greetings." <laughs> Um, oh, I love it so much. <laughs> there is there is literally a plot about this plan. Uh, there is literally a plot in one of these books that is li- that is literally the rebellion goes to a water world and mm-hmm. has to save the whales uh, <laughs> that are being harvested by the empire. Yeah. Um, there. This is all. Yeah. Also, this yeah. is the the creation of Trioculus, who is the three eyed imposter son oh, okay. of the emperor gotcha. um, yeah, because yeah. there's there is a good there is a good son of the empire who emperor who has three eyes his name is triclops <laughs> um oh. the the amount of bullshit about this series is like it oh, is yeah. it is unhinged there's literally a scene there's literally an illustration of a robot princess leia killing trioculus with laser eyes <laughs> That is a thing that happened in this series. So. Oh man, that's <laughs> oh, it's so good. I'm it's... so I'm so glad it exists, and I never want to read it because it can't possibly be better than my imagination. Uh, no, it's it's. I think it's like it's perfect. Yeah. Um, there's also a lost Jedi prince. That that's you know <laughs> nice. Um, which is literally just we needed to have a child protagonist for this because it was a junior novel. Yeah, and yeah Everybody yeah. else was too old. Awesome. Yet they're they're. <sighs> The only thing that has really changed with my appreciation for Star Wars over the years is that at some point, some rubber band in me snapped, and now I enjoy all of the terrible bullshit. Like, oh, yeah. there was a time when the presence of um, Han Solo's green rabbit friend who existed in the comics would have made me mad, and now it is the best thing that have existed in Star Wars, and I can't remember oh, the fucking yeah. name off the top of my head. Like... Like the 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 dumber it can be, the more on your bullshit people are allowed to be, the better it is. Yeah, um, Jackson. That's the Jackson. Same. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it was like one of the first. He he he. Because I, I know this weird. Because like he was he was in the original Marvel Comics run of Star Wars. Yeah. 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 Which is, oh, that. Uh, but I mean, it's. I think. I think. Yeah. Part of it is like realizing that it's like. Is the is the is the movement from this is dumb and I hate it to this is dumb and I love it? Yes. Um, like I think the, the best thing that came out of the Disney reboot, honestly, in my opinion, or, or one of the best things that's happened in the reboot, is the character of Doctor Afra. Okay. Who, Doctor Afra is a lesbian Indiana Jones who who occasionally runs around with a murder bot version of C three PO and R two. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, th- there's like the, there, there's all that. There's the long argument about what is a true fan, right? And I, I, I'm not interested in that argument mostly, but I will posit one criteria, which is that if you cannot see the flaws and love the flaws while recognizing them as being a flaw, then you are, if not a true fan, you are maybe a bad fan of something. <laughs> That, like, yeah. you have to be able to look at something that you love dearly and is formative to you and go, wow, that's dumb. And also amazing because of how dumb it is, you know? And, like, yeah. to recognize that it's bad and stupid, but that you love it anyway is important to being a, a whole person, I think. <laughs> we're we're preparing a... We're preparing for, for what we're going to do after Person of Interest mm-hmm. on Bad Pod because... Um, the the CW in uh, Warner Brothers Discovery's Ultimate Upheaval, yeah, as maybe pushed B five the B five reboot back a year. We don't know, yeah. like JMS doesn't know, yeah. um, you know. But so we're having to find another series to cover time, and yeah, um, 
like there there is some stuff of like I know that we're going to have some rough patches in in, in like the first season or two of what we're doing next. Yeah, yeah. But honestly, it's all stuff that I'm going to be able to laugh at. Yes. So you know, it's like I I'm I, I we're we're, we're going to have to talk in speculation because I know what you're talking I know what you're what it is and mm-hmm. I'm desperately interested to see hear, hear y'all's perspective on it because mm-hmm. I'm very I I really love y'all um the way that yeah. you treat media and it, hearing your perspective on it might give me new eyes and I'm I'm yeah. really interested to see that. Okay, so we I, I put a pin in it a minute ago, but yeah. we have to talk about BattleTech because if there is any yeah. media in the world that is awful and terrible and you love it because of all of that, it's BattleTech. <laughs> oh my gosh, I so Battle uh, and BattleTech like so my first experience to it was one of the MechWarrior video games. No, yeah. no, it was okay. not one of the MechWarrior oh, videos. Oh really? It was Mech Assault. Oh, which is yeah. the which yeah, yeah, Mech, yeah. so so for folks who are maybe not fans of BattleTech. So the yeah. MechWarrior series is a PC is a PC series of games that are set in the BattleTech universe. BattleTech is big stompy robots with a lot yeah. of guns. Yes, yes. Um, nuclear powered robots. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the MechWarrior games I think are overall very good. Like yeah, 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 the, yeah. the most recent one is not great but is still very fun and mm-hmm. captures what you like about battletech pretty well yeah mech assault is a stripped down arcade version yeah. of it that was released it was, a, it was a launch title for the original xbox yes i remember um, this well yes and, and it's an it's much more of an the the, the mech warrior games were simulator games that's yes. that's they were trying so hard to be flight simulator but for robots yes. mech assault is an arcade game Yes, yeah, and so, um, which, which is very funny that like, um, comparatively, like I bounced off Mega Assault because yeah. um, I'm not a very good like, I'm, I'm as a gamer, I've never been a very good like reaction or Twitch based gamer, mm-hmm. um, and Mech Warrior is a much slower game, um, like relatively, yes, um, and, and it's 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 a, it's a lot more plotting and like yeah. thoughtful and everything's uh, got weight and momentum to it in a way that you have to be thinking ahead of what's happening which yeah happens at a slower pace than something like mech assault for sure and yeah it's and so then i eventually got into it i, I it's sort of one of those things that it's like um eventually mech warrior 4 mercenaries became freeware oh really um, okay so like every year or two i would reinstall it play mm-hmm. through it and enjoy it enjoy the hell out of it yeah, yeah um it wasn't until college that i found out that there was like real lore around it oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. which i i had a friend who um pa- uh, pablo is who is what I, i've been friends with him for like close to 15 years now mm-hmm. he's he's fantastic he i literally met him because i i used to play warhammer mm-hmm. and he worked at the games workshop that i would go to right right um <laughs> <laughs> which you know it, uh, fantastic person mm-hmm. and one day starts telling me about the tabletop version of battletech yes um if you have played a tabletop war game and you have seen a chart that has made your that has made a blood vessel burst in your brain that is the par average of the course for battletech <laughs> it is yeah i I am. I'm probably one of the lar- the the. I, I have a huge love for BattleTech. I love the series. I love or the uh, the world. I love lots of the properties in it. I have never actually played the tabletop because when reading the rules, my brain slides off of the. <laughs> like it's like a it's like a gak hitting a uh, flushly laminated sheet of paper, and it just and then and it's gone. <laughs> I cannot retain it's... any information. <laughs> Um, yeah, because the thing about BattleTech, the um, the the actual like tabletop game, is that it is designed to interface with all as- all all other aspects of the tabletop game. Yeah. In a in a su- supposedly cohesive manner. So yeah. I mean, which like there are rules for aerospace fighters that involve yep. Newtonian physics. There are. Mm-hmm. Rules for if you are using artillery and smoke, rolling in determining wind speed. Um, there hey. are literally rules for generating solar systems with astronomically correct orbital periods. That's awesome. 
It's it's not quite uh, the Italians need extra water rations to ha- boil their pasta, but it's yeah, yeah right in that realm. <laughs> it's it's close. It's close. Yeah. Um, there there yeah there's just like it's so specific, and I think yeah. that's part of why it's captivating is yeah. that like there's so much depth to it, and yeah. you can build your own shit in it, which is oh, yeah. I think the the BattleTech universe something I think it it actually shares with. Maybe not the current version of Star Wars, but the definitely the '90s version of Star Wars was that they had a combination of a great big universe that had touch points that were well defined, and also a lot of history. So there was like an arc of how the plot was going, the overarching plot was going, yeah. and then tons of space in the middle where you could do whatever the fuck you wanted. Like yeah. the the Star Wars um, and the Star Wars fandom or the fan fictiony sections of Star Wars back in the day, and the People who are making up their own campaigns for BattleTech are all living in the same sort of space, the place between the lines, you know, yeah. and doing a lot of uh, uh, just ridiculous stuff. Um, and it's also they both share a, 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 an aspect of being a, a universe that's sci-fi and run down. Like yeah. it's not post-apocalyptic; it's kind of post-apocalyptic, but it's mostly just yeah. everything's been kept running so long that it's barely held together with bar- bailing wire and duct tape, and that's the yeah. entire universe. The idea of at least the inner sphere, which is the the main mm-hmm. region of BattleTech, having been at war constantly for three hundred years, yeah. and the idea of what that does to economies and yep. uh, and like technological decay is such an interesting. It, it's such an interesting point to launch a series from. Yeah. Um, and like there, there's part of me that like. Basically, the way that the the BattleTech timeline goes, listeners, is that there was a high point of humanity. Lots of yeah. war happened, and we lost a lot of technology, including the cool shit. Yes, uh, but we still got to keep the robots. Yes, and then we, have, we can't slowly... make new ones necessarily. <laughs> yeah, or not very well yet. But yeah, we're having to dig that shit up out of out of caches to find new technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was one of the things that I all that I find like incredibly fascinating uh, for. BattleTech is the idea of like these caches of lost technology. Yeah. Um, honestly, it, it, like I will never say to anybody, play the like you know play the tabletop game or anything no. as their introduction. Play the Hairbrain Schemes video game because it is the most like it, it it captures everything about the tabletop game that is great. Okay. That, that like does that it does well. Yeah, like randomized hit locations, customizing mechs. Um, yeah, yeah, and like, and also like the feel of it, where it's this weird neo feudalism. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Where, like, I think there are parts of BattleTech that, like, uh, okay, there are parts of BattleTech's lore that are either incredibly of it, like, I don't want to say of its time. Like there, there's stuff that is incredibly eighties. Yeah. And there's, I like in with that, especially in some of the earlier stuff, there's a lot of Orion orientalist, uh, BattleTech as a universe is, is a, is one that a modern fret, someone with modern fresh sensibilities would walk into, look at the, the vast majority of things right on the surface and go, no bullshit. I'm gone. Cause it's, it was made in the nineties in the eighties and nineties. And it, before anybody knew to be nice, basically. Yeah. Yeah. The weirdly, BattleTech was my fr- was one of my first um, encounters with mentioning like a possible trans character. Oh, really? Um, like, uh, like there there was mm-hmm. a point in one of the books where, um, they where they're trying to identify a leader who's yeah. appeared out of nowhere and is kicking the ass of people and. Like the spy network is like we can't figure out who this person is. Yeah. Um, like we've gone through everything. We've gone through the possibility that they might have like that they might have transitioned their like like what we would say is like transitioned their gender. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. And, and, and they're like and it's one of those things where it's like it's the first time I notice something like that, or it's like not yeah. like. Um, and, and it's like it's just listed as one of the possible things of like okay what yeah, can yeah. somebody do to hide their identity yeah, yeah. Uh, which was just wild it was, it was it's in a book that was written in like 1987 or something yeah yeah um, well like it's so weird when sci-fi authors do that where they they almost put they don't put enough thought into it to be 
be, be bad about it yet. Like yeah. they, they 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 mention it so something like that so offhandedly, and and surprisingly treat it relatively neutrally because they didn't have time to be assholes about it like they would have been if they'd spent any time. <laughs> yeah, I, and I think I think like modern BattleTech writers, be, which is strange because apart from like uh, modern BattleTech writers have actually done. I would say fairly well to adapt mm-hmm. to modern sensibilities Good. with the exception of a couple of people who are, I mean, have been excised from sure. creating stuff from there Good. because they have been proven to be bad people. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Good. Like, Good. I think, I think that like overall it's, it's a series that has tried to at least do better. And Good. like the harebrained schemes game is like, it's like it, it, First thing it does is it presents a very non-white battle tech, which is good. Good, yeah. um, like the um, the main ro- noble family of the the central polity that the game is centered around are, I believe, Pacific Islanders. Oh, cool. Yeah, uh, it, it, or like primarily, mm-hmm. uh, and it, like it shows it shows a it shows a a a, a very good and. Like it shows a well fleshed out thirty first century, which is like Good. perfect. Right? Yeah, yeah. And it's also one of the, it's also one of the um first games I encountered, at least like in like I wouldn't call it a triple A title, but it's like got that f- flourish. Yeah. Of being able to like select your character's pronouns and having a they them option, which is cool. awesome. Cool. That's cool. Yeah. Though when I you you were introduced to uh, BattleTech through Mech Assault. Yeah. It's entirely possible that my first battle tech was MechWarrior 2, the original MechWarrior 2. It's possible. Yeah. But I'm almost certain that before I ever cracked open any of the video games, that I somehow got my hold on some of the source books that were just oh. lists of mechs and all of the technical data about them, including oh, all yeah. of the... Which, experiencing... not Never hearing... Not being told what the inner sphere was... Not being told what the Star League was, any of this stuff, not not none of the plot, not knowing any of the houses, and just reading technical data about giant robots and getting drip fed backhandedly the information about what this universe was oh, yeah. to learn everything about it. That's still my frame of reference for how this stuff is reading through source books of just lists, you know, mechs and what they were, is mm-hmm. such it's a it's such a weird experience for how to how to tell a story like it yeah. wasn't the way anybody set out to tell a story because they had they wrote actual source books that explained all of this stuff yeah. it's just that i happened to come in through the back door and th- and it's i i to this day am still kind of low-key thinking about could i tell could i do this on purpose right could i just yeah. write wiki dry ass wiki articles about technical data of things and end up flushing out a whole universe for it and telling a story through it i think it would be fascinating I'm 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 listening slash reading. Uh, I, I like it, it's the first part of it's available on podcast, but the rest mm-hmm. of it is is. I mean, I'm reading a project right now called The Edge of Midnight, which is, uh-huh. um, it is a Star Trek fan fiction work. I guess the okay. best way to put it. Um, the idea it's it's like a third done or something, mm-hmm. but the idea of it is to take everything from the TV series, the beta material of all the weird like non-canon mm-hmm. star trek stuff and try to c- try to like collate it into one narrative history mm-hmm. of the federation klingon cold war oh cool of like th- up through like up from like discovery up through like star trek six sure yeah yeah which i it's like i find that fascinating of like and like presenting it as like an in-universe historic like history book like yeah. or, or like a, a paper that's cool I, I just think like there's something like of of using the alternative like formats beyond like your traditional like yeah. narrative yeah, yeah. to like tell these stories which i think is so fascinating yeah and, like the that's source really cool. books um like battletech would all battletech would do these things where like you would always get like a short story or two in the source book but then you'd get like all the real chunky data mm-hmm. um but like and every but like even like in everything there's there's things that are so evocative yeah. and um 
in like BattleTech stuff because it's never like when when you're reading like the the fluff for a mech and it's listing its weapons, it's never just medium laser. It's a dynamic optics 150 medium laser. Yes, they just they had to they like and by cre- by throwing all of that in, they're like, okay, well, there's they've created a company called Dynamic Optics, and now yeah. they, they they might reference elsewhere, and you'll see them show up. It it's such an interesting way to tell to build a universe. Yeah, and the more and there's so many weird uh, Easter eggs that are put in BattleTech because you have so many of these lists and source mm-hmm. books, like the fact that Apple bought a planet. <laughs> and this was like a that. joke that was made in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That they literally bought a planet and named it Macintosh. <laughs> That's great. Um, or that General Electric exists, like, or like yeah. General Motors exists. Uh, like yeah, yeah, General century. Motors still exists. Yeah, they make Macs. Um, or they make the reactors for Max, I think it was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, well, we should probably circle in for a landing here. Um, yeah. But uh, I will, I have to, I have to say for that, uh, just before we leave, the Mech Warrior 2 games, I have never heard any games that have better soundtracks than the original oh three it's, Mech Warrior 2 games. There, There's nothing more that will, like, get you pumped than, like, listening to, like, some of the Mech Warrior 2 stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and before we go, we just have to we I have to um, I have to mention the most important battle tech oh, sure. piece of media, which is the cartoon. Uh. <laughs> the yep. cartoon, which had CG, which did their did their mech battles in CGI. Yeah, because God before, bless them. Before CGI really could be done, like yeah, they I think it might have been post reboot, um, but they did not use the reboot team, and so it was not good. <laughs> It was 1994, so I think it was pre-reboot. Uh, no, they, it's concurrent. Oh, okay. Uh, reboot started in 1994 as well. Wow. Um, and the the mainframe, the team that did reboot was mainframe, and they were the best. And they did not do the BattleTech series, so it was they were definitely getting some substandard, off off brand stuff. Um, not good. The, which <laughs> I the, wholly I recommend mean, it, but it's not good. Yeah. The yeah, yeah. the BattleTech the BattleTech cartoon has the best line read in the history of the world. Okay. Um, because it's about the clan invasion, and we don't. There's no there's no amount of time that could explain the clan, except that they're furries. They're 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 techno barbarian furries. Oh yeah yeah yeah. You, you could look at them that really way. That's really what they, is. they yeah, have yeah. personas. <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. Uh, although um, they're not the cat girls, which also exist in the universe. The genetically God. engineered cat cat people. But there's a line read in like the first episode of. And where a clan leader is addressing a planet, he's like, I'm Star Colonel Nikolai. Malthus. I'm to Attention, Somerset. I am Star Colonel Nikolai Malthus of the Jade Falcon Clan. A full trinary stands ready to conquer your planet. What forces dare oppose us? Is this some kind of joke? You dare to refuse my bajol? Refuse your what? Prepare to feel the wrath of the Falcon's claws. <laughs> Which... I is the it's such a stupid line, but it's the yeah. best read ever. And yeah, God, God. That, yeah, uh, we, we don't have time. To- we don't have time to get into the clan, but they're such beautiful <laughs> bullshit. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now we got. We got. I got to just end it. We, we got to punch it. We got to punch out. I got to. I got to hit the eject there, button because we'll be here all fucking. There, night. there is literally the 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 nuclear option of podcasts is a battle tech lore podcast. <laughs> God, we we wouldn't survive. We'd die. We'd literally die. Okay. If if people want to find you on the internet, Justin, where, where could they find you? So you can find me on Twitter. I that's probably the best place to find me, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But it's at J U S T E N Writes. Like yes. Justin Writes stuff. Um so um and I am also on the OK So po- the OK So Podcast Network. Mm-hmm. Um I am the newbie to the complete discography, which is almost done yeah. as a show. And I am one of the hosts of the Babylon project, which is presently, we, we were originally a Babylon five podcast and now we are watching the criminally underrated person of interest. Yeah. 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 Uh, definitely. Definitely go check out um, both, uh, both of those podcasts. They're fantastic. Uh, some yeah. Of the best co- 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 if podcast. You, if you want to hear, if you want to hear me actually be like, try to be smart about stuff, listen to complete discography. Yes. If you want to listen to me be like ridiculously stupid and horny, watch, listen to that <laughs> pod. Um, yeah. 
uh, bad like, pot like, has, I, I has give, big give, horny energy. <laughs> I give people options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> got to cover all the bases. Yeah, I also occasionally write for a site called Geek Crashers, uh, geekcrashers.fan, where I do TV, where I've done, where I've written about wrestling. I do TV reviews as well as comics. Great, awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Justin. This has been this has been fantastic. Yes, always a pleasure talking to you. Well, that does it for another episode of Media That Made Us. Thanks again to Justin for coming on and, well, frankly, being totally on their bullshit with me. You should head over to the description of this episode and find their podcasts and other social media links. If you've been enjoying this podcast, perhaps you'd like to let me know. I am Scott Paladin on just about every place where Scott Paladins are. Or you could head on over to patreon.com slash curse knowledge and throw me a few dollars help keep the lights on around here this has been a production of the library of cursed knowledge podcast network